Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless during the end times the bible says that wickedness and evil will run rampant all over the world we can already see our world being consumed by liberal leftist propaganda such as legalizing gay marriages allowing homosexuals in the pulpit increased sexual immorality and other vices that are clearly forbidden in the bible to be a Christian today is to rebel against these vices and to speak out against the highly weird experience that is beginning to invade almost every aspect of our lives and society. In fact, the Bible said that these things would occur in the end times and that even Jesus warned that by resisting these things that Christians would be hated by all nations. Jesus said the world hated him first so that we should expect that the world will hate us as well. Satan isn't masking his intentions anymore, is he? Battle lines are being drawn, and people are choosing sides. If you know someone who doesn't know the Lord, tell them. Time is definitely running out for them to come to Jesus. Revelation 12.12 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. A good indicator, we are living in the last moments of human history is that Satan has infiltrated our society in every way possible. We must understand Satan hates us because we are created in the image of Almighty God. Satan wants not only to be like God, but wants to exalt himself above God as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan has worked his way onto the TV screen, where he is portrayed as a fun and caring guy on the path of redemption, where women love him and men want to be him. Satan is busy deceiving mankind, and mankind is falling for his deceptions. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Make no mistake about Satan. There is no redemption for him. His fate has been sealed, as we read in Revelation 20.10. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan wants to take as many people to hell with him as possible. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Meet Bambi Thug, an Irish songstress, who's a finalist at the international music competition, Eurovision. Bambi goes by they, them pronouns, is a self-described goth goblin gremlin, and a Ouija pop star. And boy, is they, them something special. What makes you special and what's your favorite part of your performance? Do you know what makes me special? I'm a queer. <laughs> and I'm a witch! First Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The Bible expressly condemns all forms of witchcraft, as we read in Deuteronomy 18.9-12. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, 
The Lord your God drives them out from before you. God takes witchcraft very seriously. And the penalty for practicing witchcraft under Old Testament law was death, as we read in Exodus 22.18 and Leviticus 20.27. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. A man also, or woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. The New Testament condemns witchcraft as well. Galatians 5, 19-21 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Witchcraft is Satan's realm, and he excels in counterfeiting what God does. When Moses performed miracles before Pharaoh, the magicians did the same things through demonic power as we read in Exodus 7, 8-11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And he practiced the dabbles in a power source other than the Lord Jesus Christ is witchcraft. Revelation 21.8 includes witches in a list of those who will burn in the lake of fire. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Christians must renounce any involvement with witchcraft following the example of the early believers in Acts 19, 19 through 20. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things, including the weather. This is all that remains of a village in Afghanistan's Baglan province. The region has been hit hard by flooding. Survivors are mourning the dead and trying to figure out how they can carry on. People are under the water. Our children are under the floods. Their legs and hands are broken. We do not have any place to spend the night. A dry winter has affected the soil, making seasonal flooding much worse than usual. Baglan has been affected the most, but other regions are also suffering. Thousands of homes have been destroyed and large tracts of agricultural land have been ruined. Many people are stranded and thousands are in need of supplies and medical attention. The government has declared a state of emergency. It says evacuations are underway and help is being dispatched to those in need. Buried under mud and debris, the ruins of what were family homes. 
The force of Friday's flood destroyed thousands of properties across Baglan province. This is my life that you see now. All these were houses before, one house after another. A scary flood came and took everything with it. It also took more than 300 lives, according to the Taliban's Ministry for Refugees, a number that is likely to rise. Many of the victims have already been buried. I lost 13 members of my family, including women and children. Floodwaters washed out entire villages and livelihoods. We don't have clean water to drink and there's nowhere to live, nothing to use. Everything, including the school and the clinic, are gone. Unseasonal heavy rains caused the flash flooding, sweeping through several provinces across Afghanistan. Baglan is considered the worst affected. I don't know what help is coming to us from the government. There is no life left for us anymore. Where should we go? This is my house and all of it is destroyed. There is no life left for me anymore. Many of the roads in and out of the regions are paved in mud, making it difficult for rescue teams to reach remote areas. Diggers are needed to carve out a path. I expect the government and the UN to provide us with shelter, water, medicine and somewhere to live so that all these people can be safe. The people of Baglan are waiting for that desperately needed help to arrive. People displaced by unprecedented rains keep arriving in shelters in the southern Brazilian city of Porto Alegre. Everton Machado was searching for his missing parents when he got stranded. They rescued me by boat. I called out to them. They stopped, took me in and brought me here. I was soaked. They welcomed me well. They gave me clothes. Now I'm fine. Authorities say more than 100 people remain missing across the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Air Force has been deployed to drop loads of aid in isolated communities. But Saturday brought more rain, further complicating the already difficult operations. Many people see rain and are afraid. We understand people's fear. They know that when it rains, the water rises even more. The devastating floods have also affected parts of neighboring Uruguay. More than 2,000 people have been displaced there. I was here and the lagoon started to overflow. And when it overflowed, I had to leave. We took what we could with a friend. We put the mattresses on top of the tables. Back in Brazil, authorities say more rain is expected over the weekend promising more mayhem in what is already one of the worst climate disasters in the country in decades. Police, soldiers and volunteers have formed a search and rescue team, hoping to find survivors following flash floods in West Sumatra. Heavy downpours and torrents of cold lava from one of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, caused a river to breach its banks and engulf mountainside villages in the province. The flooding was very sudden. The river became blocked, which eventually resulted in an outburst of water everywhere. It was out of control. Almost a hundred homes were severely hit, with temporary evacuation centers set up by the local government. The National Disaster Management Agency said equipment and personnel have been deployed to clear the roads blocked by fallen tree trunks. The disaster comes just two months after heavy rains triggered floods and landslides in West Sumatra, killing at least 21 people and leaving five others missing. We turn now to those fast-growing wildfires in Canada, forcing thousands to evacuate their homes. More than 140 active fires, the majority raging across British Columbia and Alberta, causing poor air quality and reducing visibility. And that smoke is already impacting air quality in North Dakota, Minnesota, and other parts of the U.S. Tonight, firefighters are racing against the clock to contain wildfires that are consuming parts of Canada. In northern British Columbia, thousands of residents in multiple communities evacuating. 90 of the country's active fires are in British Columbia and Alberta. Thick smoke in Edmonton, Alberta's capital city, home to nearly one million people. The smoke from those fires now making its way across the border and into the upper Midwest. The entire state of Minnesota and much of Wisconsin under an air quality alert for unhealthy air through tomorrow. Last summer, much of the U.S. impacted by smoke from the fires burning throughout Canada. The New York City skyline turning orange amid the hazardous air quality. Rachel, Canada is coming off its worst wildfire season on record. The current widespread drought is not helping anything with the potential for another rough wildfire year ahead. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. 
For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens, and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word, Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. We want to begin with the story we've led this broadcast with almost every night this week. Deadly and dangerous storms unleashing fury and dozens of tornadoes from Michigan to Florida. A line of severe thunderstorms, winds gusting above hurricane force, and tornadoes tore through the Florida panhandle, including the city of Tallahassee, early this morning. This drone video shows the long trail of destruction to homes and businesses, roofs you can see in some cases completely gone. Massive chunks of hail battered parts of central Texas, with some pieces bigger than a baseball. Fierce howling winds slammed into Tallahassee early this morning, packing powerful 84 mile per hour winds, which left behind widespread destruction, ripped off rooftops, tossed vehicles, downed power lines, and toppled trees. There's trees in people's houses. You got trees on top of houses. Uh, this is some of the worst storm I've seen since I've been in Tallahassee. Just west in Crestview, this gas station Ani was shredded into pieces, scattering debris for several blocks. It's part of a weather system that has been wreaking havoc across the south and much of the central Midwest. Near record signs hail, the signs of melons fell in Johnson City, Texas, damaging homes and forcing residents to seek shelter. Yo, look at the pool. Back in Tallahassee, yeah. business owner Anna Edson McBride says part of her roof is missing, but she still feels lucky. My optimism has been my faith for a really long time, and and somehow I think that it'll it'll still be there for me. Nearly every business here in the art district has suffered substantial damage. And Nora, that art studio owner that we spoke to, she said that she's lived here in Tallahassee for 10 years. She's gone through two hurricanes and that she's never seen storm damage like this. Watch as this tornado rips through western Pennsylvania, shredding rooftops. The National Weather Service preliminarily says a twister was an EF2, with wind speeds of up to 118 miles per hour, leaving some residents forced to seek shelter, including about 100 members of this local church, some infants. I go out and I see debris flying all over the auditorium, so I immediately tell everybody down in the basement. The tornado striking in the middle of church services. Watch as the lights go out as the pastor's wife was in the midst of a song. I thought I heard the windows start to shatter, and then the, um, the sound was like a train coming through. That's the church steeple that flew off the building and damaged several cars. The pastor says, amazingly, no one was seriously hurt. The severe weather continuing a trend of tornadoes over the weekend, with four preliminary ones reported yesterday across the Ohio Valley and three potential ones in southwest PA. The National Weather Service reports there have been a staggering 746 preliminary tornadoes year to date, some that have recently decimated through the heartland. But back in Pennsylvania, cleanup is still underway tonight. I heard the winds, like real strong winds at my house a half a mile away. Many also thankful they survived. There's no way we should be here. I'm telling you, the God was with us. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end-time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. 
They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. To the war in Ukraine, officials say Russian troops are making significant gains in the Northeast as both sides trade accusations over an apartment complex explosion that reportedly killed at least 15 people. Ukraine is facing possibly its most dangerous situation since this war began, with Russia making a new push in the Northeast of this country. This as the death toll from that apparent missile attack in southern Russia is climbing this morning. Overnight, an apparent direct hit on an apartment building in southern Russia. Moscow blaming Ukraine for the attack on the city of Belgorod, though Kyiv has not taken responsibility. At least 15 people killed and more than a dozen injured, according to local authorities. During the ongoing search and rescue, part of a roof collapsed, sending emergency workers fleeing. It comes as just over the border in Ukraine's Kharkiv region, a new Russian offensive is underway, forcing thousands to evacuate. The Russians are erasing Vovachansk from the face of the earth, says the head of Kharkiv's regional police. They're using the scorched earth method. President Zelensky says reserve forces are en route. For months, the Ukrainian military has been rationing ammunition, as much-needed U.S. aid was tied up in political gridlock. Three weeks ago, the U.S. Congress passed a $61 billion aid package, but the delay seems already to have given Russia a significant advantage. Israeli forces are pushing ahead with their attacks on Hamas in the city of Rafah. Israel is united in its mission, while Washington is divided over President Biden's decision to withhold key weapons from the Jewish state. Today, Israel celebrates its Memorial Day with soldiers wounded in the war on Gaza speaking words of encouragement to keep fighting unto victory. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Israel paused for two minutes this morning as the nation commemorate its Memorial Day. At the opening ceremony, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promised to continue the Gaza operation and declared what wounded soldiers from the war have told him. All of them without exception, even the amputees, they told me the spirit of the people lifts them up. Keep going until victory and that's how we will do it. The spirit of the people with God's help will continue to lift us up in the faithful challenges that are still ahead of us and that we had in our 76 years of independence. More than 300,000 Gazans have already fled Rafa. Some have escaped to safe zones established by the Israel Defense Forces to get them out of harm's way. Israeli forces have pushed deeper into the city, the last major stronghold of Hamas. So far, they're using targeted strikes without launching a major invasion. This may address President Biden's threat to halt American weapons shipments to Israel if it does undertake a major assault. Israel also pounded northern Gaza, where some Hamas terrorists have fled and regrouped after the IDF cleared that area months ago. At the same time, Hamas has continued to fire rockets at southern Israel, including one that struck a playground in the southern Israeli city of Beersheba. According to the Washington Post, the Biden administration offered to share intelligence about where Hamas leaders are located if Israel holds back on a major attack on Rafa. Some Israeli analysts question why the U.S. wouldn't share such vital intelligence anyway with its strongest ally in the Middle East. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken delivered some of the strongest U.S. criticism yet of Israel's conduct of the war. Going into uh, to Rafa, even to deal with these remaining battalions, um, especially in the absence of a plan for civilians, risks doing terrible harm to civilians and not solving the problem, a problem that both of us want to solve, which is making sure Hamas cannot again uh, govern Gaza. But Republicans and many Democrats are pushing back hard against the president's actions on withholding weapons for Israel. Representative Michael McCall from Texas said an invasion of Rafah is necessary to complete Israel's mission. For us to step in and say, no, you can't go into Rafah and finish the job, I think it's tantamount to an, an, an arms embargo. It's also very similar 
for us to say in World War II, hey, uh, like my dad's generation, you can invade all the way up to Berlin, but you can't go into Berlin to finish the job. Despite the White House's actions, Israel is promising on the eve of its 76th Independence Day to push ahead until Hamas is finally defeated. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Food in Chad has become so expensive that families are forced to ration what they eat. In markets across the capital, produce is plenty, but buyers are not. How Adam came here to see what she could afford. Before, 36 US cents would buy you two cups of beans, but now that only gets you one cup. She says her family must decide between eating fewer meals or buying less nutritious food. But traders say they aren't to blame. We buy from farmers at a high price. Add to that the cost of transportation because of bad roads and rising energy costs. Food prices rose sharply here in Chad when neighboring Nigeria restricted exports. Other factors like high fuel costs, climate change and the presence of more than 600,000 Sudanese refugees have intensified competition over what little food is available. United Nations agencies say the situation is desperate. We have already two million people in Chad, Chadian people, under severe malnutrition. It's, uh, I think, the third, fourth time in the last decade that we have such, such an issue with food insecurity. The next three months, which aid organizations describe as the lean months, are expected to be the most difficult for people in Chad dependent on food assistance. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. It may be one of Houston's most horrifying murders caught on camera. This really shocked a lot of us here in the newsroom. 
It did, and sources close to this case tell me that this is some of the most horrifying footage they have seen in their careers. Police haven't said if the victim knew the killer, but they're hoping that a neighbor's video leads to a quick conviction and justice for his family. Only on 13, deeply disturbing and shocking video of a murder in broad daylight. On May 3rd, the victim, Stephen Anderson, is walking on Woodridge Square Drive to pick up his mail, sources tell us. He turns around at the sound of a screeching car speeding right into him. We're pausing the video right before he gets hit. The car reverses and hits him again, pushing him further into the street. Neighbors are on the phone, frantically calling 911. Another neighbor comes out with a pillow. And that's when the suspect, Karen Fisher, identified in court records as a man, but also described as she by police, returns with a knife in hand. The suspect yanks and flips Anderson over, straddles him, and kisses him. We're not showing what happens next because it's too graphic, but that's when police say Fisher stabs him nine times. She casually walks off as if nothing happened and neighbors just watch. She then tries getting into another car while talking to witnesses. When that's unsuccessful, she leaps over the body and walks away. It's very disturbing, yeah, because, you know, I have kids here. So it, it, no, kids could have been out here playing and, and imagine that. 20 year old Karen Fisher is in jail tonight, charged with murdering this 64 year old. Her bond is set at two million dollars. Broad daylight. It was. It was people. Were, it was. It was a busy intersection. It happened right, right under our, our noses. You know. Just truly so shocking. I spoke to neighbors that you saw in that video. They are still traumatized by that, as you can imagine. One woman even told me that she hasn't been to work and is trying to find a therapist. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. Second Timothy three one through five. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. In the United States and around the world, God's handiwork was on full display in the skies over the weekend as the Aurora Borealis, also known as the Northern Lights, was seen farther south than it has been for generations, leading to widely shared pictures and videos blanketing social media. It was a celestial show in the heavens that many Americans thought they would never witness firsthand. Millions across the country were treated to a green and purple glow in the night sky this past weekend. As far south as Texas in the U.S., as well as Chile, northern China, England, and northern Europe. It is a very exciting start to the day at La Lande because something wonderful happened in the night. We saw the northern light over La Lande. It was all thanks to a severe geomagnetic storm on the surface of the sun that produced a rare and powerful sequence of solar flares over several days. A rapid fire of all these uh, CMEs coronal mass ejections aimed at Earth and arriving at Earth is what drove the geomagnetic field to such an agitated state. The light show also caused some minor problems with the power grid, high frequency communications and some GPS systems, causing the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to issue a rare geomagnetic storm warning. Elon Musk said Saturday his Starlink satellite internet service was under a lot of pressure but holding up so far. An extreme geomagnetic storm in 2003 took out power in Sweden and damaged power transformers in South Africa. They're not built to use this current, so it becomes a problem. But this event was about enjoying the wonder of God's handiwork, the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights seen by many for the first time. Psalm 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.